Welcome to the Drake Group's webinar series on critical issues in collegiate athletics hosted by LRT Sports. Today's discussion, the brave new world of college athletes compensation. Our moderator is Katie Lever, Chief Communications Officer for the Drake Group. And welcome everybody to the first webinar in our series, Wild West or Brave New World. National experts share their thoughts on college athlete compensation. Next week at 7 p.m. Eastern on August 26, um, we're going to be having webinar number two where college athletes, current and former, will be discussing their viewpoints on athlete compensation and everyone attending today is going to receive an invitation to that one as well. So if you're interested in the topic, we're going to have a lot more content on it. Um, for now, now, let's go ahead and introduce our panelists. Thank you all so much for um, sticking with us through those technical difficulties. Um, the attendees have received their bios already, um, so I'm just going to do a quick introduction for everybody. We have Val Ackerman, the commissioner of the Big East Conference. We have Len Elmore, the co-chair of the Knight Commission on Intercollegiate Athletics and a darn good former NBA player. Um, we have Blake Lawrence, co-founder and CEO of Open Doors, and we have the Drake Group's Andy Zimbalis, Robert A. Woods of Economics, Smith College, and president-elect of the Drake Group. Thank you all so much for taking some time out of your day to join us and share your expertise. Um, we're going to start with a 30-minute panel discussion, during which I'm going to ask a question um, and everyone's gonna have time to respond. And then we're gonna jump into a 30 minute Q&A with the audience. So audience members, if you have any questions for our experts, please go ahead and put those into the chat throughout. And we're gonna try our best to get to those um, at the end of the uh, webinar. So why don't we go on ahead and get started? Uh, my first question is kind of a two pronged question. What is the proper place for athlete compensation in college sports? And why is it okay for athletes to be compensated for their names, images, and likenesses and not be paid for their sport? Why don't we go ahead and start with Andy? Thank you, Katie. This is a complicated question and the answer depends on what world you wanna live in. One reason it is complicated is because the NCAA has mismanaged amateurism and among other things, allowed coaches, ADs, and conference commissioners to benefit handsomely at the expense of the athletes. Another reason is because the NCAA has changed its concept and definition of amateurism so many times over the years to the point that it is hard to know what it means anymore. But the NCAA's bungling of amateurism doesn't mean that the concept is wrong. Amateurism in college sports never should have been about preventing athletes from earning income from third parties. Rather, properly applied, it should have been about not turning student athletes into employees. While we must stop athlete exploitation, it is important to keep in mind that over 98% of collegiate men's basketball and football players never play a game in the NBA or NFL. The best we can do to support these athletes is one, to make sure they get a solid, well-rounded education, and two, to offer medical care so that they're fully covered for any health-related injuries connected to their sport participation. The reason why it is okay and within the bounds of amateurism for athletes to receive NIL or publicity rights income is because it does not represent payment for playing the sport. They are still amateur athletes and crucially, when athletes are paid by third parties, it does not affect their educator, educatee relationship to the university. It is simply removing the NCAA from a sphere that was none of their business to begin with. Finally, it is necessary to recognize that the median reported annual operating deficit for the 130 FBS universities is over $18 million. And that, and that is without counting all capital and indirect costs. Every additional dollar of added expense denotes a larger subsidy to, the, to athletics from each school's educational budget. While it is true in the long run that if athletes receive direct compensation, other costs such as coaches' salaries will come down, in the short and medium run, there will be growing and unsustainable deficits. Thank you. Well, Len, you've been paid for your sport. Why don't you weigh in on this next? <laughs> uh, I was paid for my sport as a professional. As a collegiate, uh, my compensation was a quality education and opportunity. And so it makes sense to provide incentives for college students, including athletes, for academic uh, accomplishments and, and to facilitate study towards a degree. Um, you know, the Knight Commission certainly believes that universities providing educational benefits to college athletes in the form of scholarship and other benefits is appropriate. Legitimate third party payments uh, for college athletes use of their name, image and likeness is certainly appropriate. 
but it's not appropriate for an institution to provide direct payments to athletes to play their sport. You know, the courts have recognized uh, the importance and legitimacy of, of uh, prohibiting compensation unrelated to education to maintain the distinction between college and pro sports. Uh, in fact, uh, the recent uh, Supreme Court ruling in Alston underscored the NCAA's authority to, that they can still prohibit benefits and pay related, unrelated to education. Um, you know, now, why is it okay for athletes to be compensated for the name, image, and likeness, but not for playing their sport? Uh, well, name, image, and likeness is a property right. You know, and, and now, and finally, it's been recognized and should have never been abrogated by the NCAA, especially when others uh, were able to benefit from the athlete's uh, personal and, and property right. The Knight Commission favors uh, changing NIL rules to allow college athletes the opportunity to earn compensation from that property right, but to earn it from non-institutional sources. Uh, and that'll be similar to what their uh, student peers are, are receiving, if at all. You know, the commission's principles, which were released in April 2020, uh, essentially provides guardrails to ensure that athlete compensation did not blur into pay for play from the institution. And those guardrails are threefold. Prohibit institutional involvement, prohibit the athlete's use of institutional trademarks and require an independent oversight to ensure that the deals that athletes sign are, are paying fair market value to them and not a, a disguise of, of pay for play. Now, what we recognize is that there are state laws out there and some of them have some of these restrictions, but the current environment is pretty open and pretty loose. And it leaves it up to the institutions in many ways to define what's appropriate. You know, the overarching NCAA restriction that prohibits pay for play is being tested right now. And the big question is going to be whether the NCAA acts to stop or, or to change some of these deals that frankly look very much like pay for play. And I would throw out the Brigham Young case right now, uh, their arrangement with uh, their non-scholarship players as well as their players, uh, where there's no state law and the NCAA seems unwilling to, to really step in at this particular time uh, to, to make a decision as to what's permissible or not. So we have a leadership vacuum and, and we necessarily have to fulfill that. Uh, so again, you know, our idea is that with guardrails, NIL is certainly uh, a, a right that student athletes certainly should be able to, to execute. And, and that um, with these guardrails, there's nothing wrong with name, image and likeness compensation as long as it doesn't turn into pay for play. Mm -hmm. Now, Blake, you've been a really big part of this new NIL landscape. What do you think? Well, as a former student athlete, you know, I played football in Nebraska uh, a decade ago. You know, I, I'm thankful to know that today's student athletes are in a position to be able to capitalize on name, image, and likeness. And I'm super excited as a member of this industry and the technology provider, really the infrastructure for a lot of these student athletes managing NIL opportunities to have a uh, assistance in creating a, opportunities for themselves that ultimately position them in a, in a way where they're following the rules, but also quickly capitalizing on their their rights, uh, which is those name image and likeness rights, which they couldn't before. So there's a couple different perspectives. As a former student athlete, I, it is super exciting to understand that no matter what dollars get into the pockets of student athletes, it's more than zero. And all of us can agree that's, that's a good thing. Um, but you no, know, Lynn, as you speak to trying to determine, you use the word legitimate. Legitimate is a great word uh, to understand what types of NIL activities are occurring. And I know that uh, Val and, and the crew with the federal and state legislation working group for the last two plus years spent a lot of time uh, along with, with some of the folks in this call just trying to understand how to actually determine what is a legitimate NIL activity and what is not, right? And um, as we sit here today, most schools are trying to determine that themselves. Uh, state legislators are trying to interpret legislation that they wrote that they most likely didn't intend to ever have to enforce, right? And compliance officers are turning into pseudo endorsement agreement revisors and marketing reps and agents themselves. It's just a, the Wild West is another way to say it, but I, technology wise, there are ways in which we can start to understand and identify trends. And we're starting to see it already. 
there's a lot of things publicized, which will get a lot of scrutiny, but there's also other things that aren't publicized that are already being scrutinized on the back end. So there's work in progress. Athletes are in a great position, but as an industry as a whole, it is important to have that oversight. Um, so we do get a, a, a grasp on what's happening and what should be happening. Mm -hmm. And then Val, as a conference commissioner, what's your view on the, on the proper place of athlete compensation in college sports? Yeah, thanks, Katie. And I want to thank Donna, especially for giving me the opportunity to par be part of this group today. Um, I guess I'll start by saying um, it's often not noted, but there, there is a quid pro quo to many athletes for being um, uh, members of teams on their campuses. Um, you know, they're, uh, you know, if you start with scholarship, cost of attendance, permissible benefits, um, life skills training, uh, preferred admission status in some cases, the value of a college degree. I think Len noted that right at the top of his remarks. And then frankly, for many athletes, the ability to graduate debt-free is sort of no small thing. Now you can quibble whether that's compensation or something else, call it quid pro quo, but there is uh, for many athletes, extraordinary value in this opportunity. And frankly, I was like, like Blake and Len and Donna, I mean, I was one of them. I was a student athlete at the University of Virginia. I played in a non-revenue producing sport. I got my degree um, and I've gone on and I'm where I am today because of that experience. Um, you know, there's value on all of that. Um, you know, the numbers vary for our campuses. It could be as much as $100,000, $150,000 worth of value with all of those things combined. So in a manner of speaking, um, you know, that's, that's, uh, that, you know, that's available to our athletes. This notion of NIL um, it adds to the package, if you will. And I'll just sort of say on behalf of the groups I've been part of, and, and you know, I wanna thank Blake for his leadership in helping formulate um, the direction where the NCA is. Uh, working groups I, I, I was involved in, I haven't been in this business as long as some of my colleagues here, but we just recognized at the, out of the gate that NIL was appropriate compensation for student athletes today, particularly because so many other regular students, if you will, have been availing themselves of these opportunities and particularly in social media. So it didn't seem to make sense, at least to, the, to my group, that the student athletes would have any lesser opportunities. The challenge we were facing as our group worked through the regulation uh, was how to make that work in the college sports world. Um, you know, how to deal with recruiting. I mean, the pro leagues, they don't recruit. I mean, they do in free agency, but there's very strict rules, as we all know, working, we've worked in that area about how much you can pay and salary cap restraints. And certainly incoming athletes um, in a league like the NBA um, get, you know, don't get to choose their, um, their team. They have to go through the draft. So there is no sort of funny business <laughs> that's possible in this sort of initial player acquisition you know, mode. And so we were really wrestling with um, how to handle NIL in a world where recruiting is so fundamental to um, how athletes choose their schools and how to sort of maintain, if it was possible, some semblance. I mean, we all know it's sort of not equal anyway, but how to maintain some semblance of that. So that really was the problem. The problem we're struggling with now, sort of from the front lines, is the lack of consistency. Because I think, as everyone knows, Congress did not act by July 1 to come up with a uniform federal law. Um, the NCA, following the Austin decision, backed off of a um, higher regulation framework to manage questions around disclosure, institutional involvement, institutional marks, conflicts, and other, other matters in favor of the low regulation model we have now. But the fact is, if you're in a state that has a state law, that's what you have to follow for NIL. If you're in a state that doesn't have a law, you have to, you know, you're allowed to use the NIL interim policy, which basically says as long as it's not pay for play and as long as it's not a recruiting, recruiting inducement, it's fine. And so, you know, what we're seeing now is seven weeks in how those guardrails, if you will, they're very minimal, but how they're being interpreted, um, you know, what is appropriate institutional involvement with these um, arrangements. I mean, all the questions that my colleagues have raised here are being wrestled with. What's the NCA's role as the sheriff <laughs> or not? If a deal sort of looks on, on the face like it's maybe sliding towards pay for play, 
And so um, this is all kind of you know evolving as we as we speak by the day, by the week, by the month. The one thing I would add, Katie, is it relates to um, the the employment relationship. We did work hard in our group to try to differentiate third party payments for NIL versus creation of a direct employment relationship between the school and the student athlete. I mean, if you go down that pathway, I think Andy noted this as well, you do start to get into some difficult questions around minimum wage requirements, overtime, um, unionization, workers' compensation. And on the subject of unionization, that could lead to, for example, um, multiple unions based on sport on a campus. And so how that gets managed, you know, would be very cumbersome. I don't know that anybody's really spent a whole lot of time on the complexities other than to note that there are complexities. And certainly, as has been noted, the law has been on the NCA side here in terms of the classification of students as students has been upheld by the Sixth Circuit in Berger and the Ninth Circuit in Dawson, and of course by the NLRB and its rejection of the petition by Northwestern football players to unionize in 2015. So right now that's where the law is. They're students and they're not employees with everything that goes along with that. So whether that's the right model going forward, whether I agree that the relationship between the student athlete and the NCA needs to evolve, hopefully this governance review that's now underway will get to that among other questions. SAC is isn't enough, in my judgment, to represent the interests of student athletes, particularly in sports like football and men's basketball, which are differentiated in their revenue generating potential. So um, it's a work in progress for sure. But I, you know, I do think um, it should be noted that gains have been made. Have they been enough? Maybe not, but there have been gains made in this sort of notion of student athlete benefits and welfare over the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you all so much for that. So we've touched on a lot of important issues outside of NIL. We've talked about unionization, athlete debt, um, and education, just to name a few. So with that in mind, um, my second question is, there are many people who say that college sports has lost its way. Do you agree? And if so, what kind of reforms are needed to put the industry back on track? Why don't we start with you, Len? Well, I, I would say, and, and thank you, Katie, for that. Uh, right now, the current structure of the NCAA uh, is, with regard to sport is outdated. Uh, and the Knight Commission has, has demonstrated that, uh, you know, in the past December on, on our uh, website, knightcommission.org, we proposed a, a bold overhaul of the structure. You know, the last time the structural change occurred in the NCAA was in 1973, when divisions one, two, and three were created. And that was, the goal was to align the interests of institutions so as not to infect others with, you know, competitively or, or you know, with the uh, unequal balance and, and to try to bring some balance. And, and, you know, with the influx of billions of dollars in revenues, et cetera, they recognized a change was gonna come through conference media contracts, et cetera, that was tied to big revenue football. So, you know, our goal was to transform the division one model of governance and, and, and structure. And the proposal essentially said, create a new entity for the sport of FBS football and make that completely independent of the NCAA and funded by the CFP uh, and their revenues. And that would align governance uh, with the operations and, and the national championship of that sport. Remember, FBS schools would still uh, be governed by the NCAA and other sports. But for all current NCAA schools, including those with FBS football, the NCAA can continue to govern and conduct national operations for championships, uh, except for FBS football. And the new system would establish equal voting representation for all Division I conferences and keep NCAA Division I basketball tournaments the same. You know, the NCAA and the FBS entity, uh, maybe call it the National uh, Collegiate Football Association, would adopt governing principles that, uh, you know, such as those that we articulate to maintain college athletics as a public trust and, and rooted in the mission of, of higher education. Now, we have to face it, uh, better accountability for FBS football is necessary because there's no single entity that is responsible for that aspect of the sport. The NCAA, unlike other uh, sports, does not control college football playoffs. The CFP is 100% controlled by the FBS conferences. Uh, they distribute $500 million annually to FBS schools only, and that's independent from the NCAA. Um, all the revenues from the NCAA, uh, March Madness, and, and FBS football 
does not contribute to any NCAA and to any NCAA revenue uh, of, for teams that don't play FBS football. Yet the uh, NCAA financially supports all of FBS football's infrastructure costs, such as eligibility, enforcement, and legal expenses. So FBS football has an outsized influence on NCAA governance, even though only 38% of its Division I members offer the sport, whereas 100% offer basketball. So basketball is a unifying sport, and the NCAA shouldn't distribute money to a sport to schools who uh, have sports that they don't control uh, their particular championship. And for those who wonder, you know, whether spinning off an FBS uh, FBS football means that there are no Title IX enforcement opportunities. You know, the Knight Commission actually has commissioned two uh, leading national law firms to take a look at antitrust and Title I legal uh, issues and, and recognize that the creation and operation of a separate entity to govern the sport of FBS football uh, would not increase legal risks uh, regarding antitrust or Title IX. And, and that for the NCAA and non N CFA institutions. The creation and operation of the NCFA eliminates future legal exposure to potential antitrust litigation related to football because the NCAA would no longer regulate FBS football. And finally, the creation of a National Collegiate Football Association will free resources that essentially could uh, create more opportunities for gender equity. And finally, you know, we, we made suggestions as Knight Commission in the past uh, to make changes to the NCA and the CFP revenue distribution. And, you know, these are just starting points uh, for addressing how the $3 billion or more uh, that are distributed from the NCAA to CFP and the Division I conferences can better support and align with the education mission of college sports, particularly with those core values of transparency, gender equity and financial responsibility. So we'll have more to speak on this subject as we go forward. But again, going back to the original point, the current structure of the NCAA sport is certainly outdated and we have offered an opportunity and some, uh, some formulas that can certainly change it for the better. Mm -hmm. Um, Andy, I think we can all agree that the NCAA's model is outdated. You and I have talked about this at length. What are your thoughts on these reforms? College sports has lost its way. It, it did so a long time ago. Now it's in profound crisis. One can approach its reform with piecemeal changes, such as introducing, reintroducing the Division I athletes athletic certification program to advance Title IX, limiting the salaries of coaches, ADs, and conference commissioners, applying holistic admissions and eligibility systems accompanied by meaningful remediation programs before the start of college, promulgating real and binding limits on the number of hours per week, per week spent on sports teams, centralizing the college football playoff so that money is distributed more equally across the 1,100 schools in the NCAA rather than what the Knight Commission proposes, which is to say, okay, run away with your money and go govern it by yourself. No, they should be part of the system that everybody else is a part of in college sports. Providing proper medical care to college athletes and the list goes on and on. But the more effective approach would be to study a comprehensive redesign of intercollegiate athletics and its governance so that the parts of the reform program fit together and do not get co-opted by the existing powerful institutions. Val, as a conference commissioner, what are your thoughts on the current NCAA model and any necessary reforms moving forward? Well, um, I'll start by saying I agree with Len that there is this anomaly, which I've, I flagged early on, um, you know, it was noticeable to me as a basketball centric conference that the NCA does pay for many um, what I'll call national football expenses. So include litigation, health and safety initiatives, um, professional development for minority coaching candidates, but yet they're not the beneficiary of the national football revenues that come out of the FBS playoffs. Those monies flow exclusively to those uh, to those conferences. And so, you know, in effect, the football expenses are being paid for out of the basketball money, because I think as everyone's well chronicled, the NCAA is funded almost exclusively by revenues from the NCAA men's basketball tournament. So there is, um, there's a fix there that I, you know, that I think I'm, I'm with Len, I think should be considered. Um, there, listen, there's no shortage of areas where the NCAA um, could stand a good look 
and topics that I think should be um, top of the list in terms of this inquiry. And hopefully that'll be gotten to um, with, this, uh, with this governance review that's underway. I'll tick off a couple of my own. Um, I hope no matter what, we can continue the NCAA men's and women's basketball tournaments. I and mean, there has been great value, I think, in having 32 conferences and not 10 involved in this event that captivates the American public every March. So figuring out a way to keep that intact, I think is um, you know, a sort of job one. Um, there's a lot of talk now about the uh, ongoing role of the NCA national office. The two core functions they serve are to manage the national championships across three divisions. That adds up to about 89 events a year. Um, and then they are sort of in charge of trying to make rules, trying to enforce the rules, which serve as the connective tissue to keep the association 1,100 schools over three divisions together. But they do a lot of other things. And you know, many of us think that those other functions should now be subject to a robust cost-benefit analysis. So hopefully that'll happen. Enforcement is a big question. No one's happy with enforcement. Um, and so the question becomes, is there a better way to enforce those rules? Um, should it be outsourced? That's, that's come up. Should it be handled by somebody outside of the NCA system? That I know is going to get a great deal of scrutiny coming up. The jurisdiction of the conferences versus the national office as it relates to the rules making process. We saw some language coming out of Austin about that issue. Should D2 and D3 still be under the big tent? I mean, 1100 schools, is, there, is it really realistic to try to put everybody together in one association? Um, I spent eight years as the US representative on the International Basketball Federation. We only had 215 countries that were part of FIBA. We've got 1100 that are part of the NCA. It's practically unmanageable and has turned into a complex bureaucracy for that reason, because everybody wants to be at the table. We have too many committees. The decision-making process is torturous. There's nothing nimble about this organization. So trying to get a big idea through the system is painfully, painfully difficult. So whether that can be reformed or not, I don't know, but that's what we're dealing with. Um, I, you know, I applaud the Knight Commission on your thinking, Len with the possibility of a new model. It's certainly worth a look to see if FBS football should be treated in a different manner. Some say the name of the association should be changed. That NCAA, the so-called blue disc has become irreparably toxic. So maybe we need to just sort of dissolve it and come up with a different brand. Um, there is some separate conversations underway right now with the US OPC. I'm actually part of a US a college sports sustainability think tank where there's some good thinking going on on how to bring together the management of college sports with the management of our national team programs. The NGBs are out there, they're doing grassroots developments. Some are saying maybe we ought to treat every sport as a vertical instead of the NCA horizontal. You're putting 25 sports under one umbrella. But I think that review has been helpful and hopefully can be folded into the NCA's inquiry. And then ultimately, I think, you know, the question that uh, many of us uh, ask, you know, every day is, you know, what is the collegiate model? What is a student athlete in this day and age? How best should they be represented, you know, in the system? And can that model with education at the core be sustained going forward? If so, how do we do it? Big picture question, but I think that's the fundamental question we're all trying to get to at the end of the day. Yeah, those are fantastic questions. Um, Blake, what about you? Has college sports lost its way? And if so, what reforms are needed to get it back on track? Sorry, team. The, I, I would say I was on a, a Big Ten campus last week with a brand new football facility, and it was unbelievable. I mean, just to, to look and to feel the the inequity at times in terms of what resources are provided to football players on a college campus at the highest level today versus their peers, uh, especially and and sometimes that programs that have not won a lot of football games, right? But there is a tremendous amount of resources put into it. And there's some great economics that uh, everyone benefits from that, like within the community, within the athletic department, within the campus as a whole. So there, it's clear that there is some inequity. I would say that there is movement in terms of the student athletes and the outcomes in which they're receiving as participating in the system. I think they're just, they are getting better. I mean, Val, you said this, my, without the NCAA, without my football scholarship in Nebraska, what the, who, what, where am I? And like, that is every student athlete guys. Like if you actually go talk to them, like the, the ones that go through it, like there are some outliers that get, um, you know, short change because of the revenues they generate for the school that they don't get a part of, but that is 0.1%, 0.2%, 0.3%. I 
of 1%, you know, and, and for most athletes, this is life-changing stuff. So today we're moving towards a world where I think everyone has to be comfortable with name, image, and likeness monetization and allowing third-party payments, legitimate payments to flow to student athletes as a way to uh, let them participate in, again in their own God-given rights of publicity. And that is a, a world that I'm excited about. And, you know, I'll, I'll leave some of the think tanking about switching names and adding a letter here, moving this over there. Like that, that is fine and good and dandy. As long as the student athletes are getting an education, as long as they're getting uh, help, like from a, the, the medical um, side of things in terms of just taken care of, right, when they're on campus. And I would say that the other parts, as we start to see NIL legislation, we can talk about this more and more as, as much as we want, um, is that there's seven weeks in, certain things that, you know, they're all NIL activities, Lynn. You talk about that BYU, they're all NIL activities until they're not, right? Until they're not. And that, and what I talk about that is that if a student athlete is providing bona fide NIL activities in order to receive compensation, that's fantastic. But what happens if they transfer? What happens if they quit the team? You know, in that moment, somebody's got to protect that student athlete because maybe their interests or life uh, had to change in an instance. And should that impact a transaction that was supposed to be only tied to their NIL activity, not to their participation in sports, not to their attendance at a school, you know, and those are the things that uh, maybe we shift from what can, who can and cannot pay student athletes, but, but really to a, a world of, in terms of third parties, what allows somebody that has committed to pay a student athlete to stop paying them, right? It, it, that, that's kind of this quickly into a new world. So all those other parts, I'll let you guys talk about. I'll, I'll do NIL. Those are the three letters I talk about all dang day. So you guys worry about the other four. Yeah, really, really great stuff on this one. Um, we're going just a little bit over time, but I have one more question if we could keep these answers short and sweet. Um, my last question before we get to the Q&A is, can the NCAA be trusted to reform itself or is state and federal legislative uh, pressure needed as a catalyst for change? Why don't we start with you, Val? Well, I think my answer is the NCAA can be trusted to try to reform and you'll that's underway now with this governance review and this constitutional convention that's been called. I mean, I think there's well meaning people who um, have the best interests of student athletes at heart I consider myself one of them. But um, I, my guess is that it will, they will probably need help, whether it's in the form of pressure or, you know, assistance. Um, or some other device, whether it's from Congress, um, you know, the court's given the nudge. Um, I, I, you know, as I said, this is one complex bureaucracy and um, it, it may require some sort of an intervention to get to some of the desired outcomes. Mm -hmm. Len, how about you next? Well, I mean, I, it's obviously clear that, um, that there's a necessity for uniformity of rules, particularly in NIL. Uh, given the conflicting state laws that are in effect. And, you know, the NCAA with their upcoming constitutional convention, so to speak, they're probably looking based on uh, their, their failures in litigation, looking to decentralize their efforts so they can't be accused of antitrust violations. So, you know, any significant changes or reforms to strengthen the educational purpose uh, might necessarily need some kind of governmental, uh, particularly congressional uh, involvement. You know, we as a Knight Commission believe that, uh, you know, we would strongly recommend that when you look at a board of directors for all of college sports, regardless of the entity and what it's called, you know, you ought to include a majority of independent directors, those who don't have conflicts of interest. And a large number of them, at least a third or more, should be people who have been or currently are college athletes, because it's obviously in their best interest uh, that the decisions are certainly made. And real quick, I want to go back to what Andy said about the Knight Commission's transformation of, of Division I model. Andy, your proposal in an ideal world would certainly uh, be reasonable. But, you know, based upon the revenues and everything that has occurred in college sports over the last several decades, I think our, uh, our suggestion is realistic. Because like in the 70s, you know, we're aligning interests and we can free resources to apply to greater racial and gender equity by making the changes that, that we purport, and, as well as, you know, stay with the general interest of education, health, safety, and, and well-being of, of college athletes. Mm -hmm. Blake? I would say that 
to see a group, this is a, you know, as an outsider, I was president of SAC at Nebraska. So I kind of had that, up, that upbringing, but then being brought into this process with the name, image and likeness legislation and potential changes and, and for at all three levels, D1, D2, D3, and to see two years worth of work from some really smart people uh, across the country working really hard to push things through, uh, just get punted and punted and punted and punted and, and mostly due to a, an agenda of a very uh, select few, you know, individuals that have a tremendous amount of power over everyone else, um, put us where we are in terms of NIL legislation and policy across the country, right? A, a vocal few can transform this entire industry and business and uh, um, those vocal few play by different rules, I would say, in terms of, and I, I'm being ambiguous with what I'm speaking to, but I think maybe we can talk about the fact that there are some uh, conferences and, 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 and with, with certain levels of power to the revenue generation for this entire industry, right? And um, so I think that there, those, that creates challenges, right? When you're in a room and there is not equal weight in a vote and, and uh, fear can sometimes be a motivator to, to stay in the status quo. So hopefully there's some changes in the representation and voting. Um, again, that's my certain experience just recently knowing that there was a lot of work put towards something that would at least provide some level of oversight. Now, can't ignore the Alston case and the impact on you know, potential antitrust issues, but at the end of the day, a vote was to be made many months ago, uh, never got there. And I think that is the case more often than not, if I understand this uh, space correctly. All right, and finally, Andy, what are your thoughts? Well, if, if Val were president of the NCAA, I might feel differently about what I'm about to say, but look, I mean, hi history has been pretty clear. The NCA functions as a trade association for college uh, coaches and con conference commissioners and athletic directors. That's how it functions. And it's created a system that benefits those people rather than benefiting the athletes, either materially or educationally. So the NCA cannot be trusted. Uh, and frankly, neither can the courts. Uh, after decades of saying they don't want to micromanage a privately run thriving system of college sports, state legislatures and the National Congress have finally begun to take long needed action. They have realized that the government is already deeply involved in college sports, among other things, by providing over $30 billion annually in student aid programs. And as I said a moment ago, we need a new coherent system, not a series of disjointed patchwork reforms. This system has to be based on a shared vision of what we want college sports to be in our society. In my view, the original intent and still the stated purpose of college sports is to serve as an extracurricular activity to support the balancing out of the largely cerebral and sedentary experience of student life. We should pursue that purpose. In the last Congress, Donna Shalala introduced the bill that would create a national commission to study this question and to recommend the formation of a new governance system. Several current bills being considered in Congress have a similar provision. Getting college, right, college sports right is not a simple matter. It will require sustained study and contemplation by our best minds. And the sooner we start, the better. Let me just add with regard to Len's nice comment about my prior comment that I think fundamentally what the Knight Commission is doing is saying, let's restructure college sports based upon commercial criteria. And if we want to go in that direction, fine. But what, why not just take a step further then, Len, and simply make it, semi, make it, make it minor league football? Make, make them professional and stop the charade about trying to educate them and perhaps even give them, in addition to a salary, give, give them a, a voucher so they go to college sometime in the future if they want to. So I, I, my fundamental concern about what the Knight Commission is doing is they're basing it on commercial criteria rather than saying, let, let's stop the incentives to win for victory that are so strong and are governing the way we, we move in college sports. Let's start thinking about them as extracurricular activities that serve the educational purpose. And if you do that, then I think the obvious answer is you, you take control, you don't say the CFP is controlled by, uh, by the power five sports. And so let them, let them just take it. You say, no, this is college sports. It benefits from all the tax benefits, uh, tax, tax privileges and, and subsidies uh, from governments. Uh, let's, let's treat it as, as a college sport, just like all the other ones. And let's take the money that they earn and do what they do with the other 85 sports. And, and share it, not share it equally, but share it across the, the NCAA. And that will promote Title IX and that will promote the educational function of, of the university. 
Just real quick, you misinterpret what we're saying. We're not basing it on commercial. We're basing it on those values, such as education, health, safety, and well-being. We're looking for more tra greater transparency, aligning interests uh, together where some of them, let's face it, this is why I say you may be uh, reasonable in, in an ideal world, but the realistic element is you're not going to take that away. That's the public's, uh, the, the public's viewpoint as well. And that's where, uh, unfortunately, you know, we, we get in trouble. But in the end, it still comes down to the transparency of what is going on on campuses, uh, institutional balance, competitive balance, as well as institutional balance, aligning interest for their particular student athletes. But the overarching uh, element is education, health, safety, and well-being of their student athletes. And we can't get away from that. And there are different ways to skin that cat. Yes, and those are all values that we can all agree on in this room. Um, so we're going to get into the audience Q&A here in just a second. Before we do, um, we do encourage the audience members to um, click on the Drake Group links that are located in the chat to learn more about our organization, um, what we do, and how you can support our efforts. Um, but now let's go on ahead and get into some of the audience questions. Um, the first one I have is from Peter Hager. Given the growing concern for athlete mental health, what safeguards might be considered to keep student athletes from overextending themselves in pursuit of NIL related opportunities? Um, Blake, what do you think about that? Well, I, I, you say, sorry, for the mental the mental health or the weight or the balance that the question is really centered on, Katie, sorry. Yes, so how, how do, um, what safeguards can be considered to help keep student athletes from overextending themselves in pursuit of NIL opportunities? Certainly, I think there's a um, a myth that can exist that this is a, a highly distraction worthy effort in terms of name, image, likeness, monetization, and compensation. I think that in the first seven weeks, eighty percent of all NIL compensation uh, is for social media promotions. So everyone that voted and said, "Hey, I think that these kids can make some money on social media." Well, you're right. I mean, that's what this is. This, the, the bona fide, legitimate NIL activities are for online passive monetization opportunities. There's another you know, 10 percent, I mean, nearly 90 percent of these things are passive activities, licensing rights. So signing the like giving someone the ability to use your name, image, likeness on a trading card or uh, on apparel. Right. Or in a on a billboard, like those types of things. So passive monetization is there, which allows athletes to make money while they sleep. And everyone on this call wants to make money while they sleep. That's a great way for anyone in America to monetize their publicity rights. And for the majority of these athletes, this is the, the peak of their earning potential. So if they can monetize passively, then they're gonna be in a better spot. I think that there's good support systems on campus to educate. There's gonna be more and more of that. That's gonna be a good part of balance. Um, but for, for those that maybe you've heard me say this before, but these aren't your granddaddy's endorsements, okay? Like these are not uh, commercials and video shoots and uh, billboards and appearances and autograph signings. These are one click on your phone and make a thousand dollars type of opportunities. And that's what's happening in the market today. Um, we also have a question specifically for Val. Um, what primary role does a conference commissioner play regarding NIL? Um, oh, I, the question just disappeared. Um, so I'm going to paraphrase it. What role does a conference commissioner have um, in terms of name, image, and likeness uh, for college athletes? Well, thanks, Katie. Um, the, the answer is um, we're, we're trying to find out. Um, you know, one, of the one of the questions is what role can the conference play in terms of, for example, formulating a conference policy around NIL that all of your schools will subscribe to in an environment where state laws um, for the most part, are going to dictate what a, an institution can or can't do in terms of managing um, NIL endeavors. I mean, just by way of example, we've got 11 schools in our conference. Six have laws. They're all different. They're all different. Um, the other five, um, three have pending legislation that are different from the first six, and then two don't have a law at all. So in those places, they are able to avail themselves of the interim NIL policy, which is very bare bones, it effectively says, as I mentioned at the top, as long as it's not pay for play or a recruiting inducement, the school can structure its own policies. So that really, frankly, doesn't leave um, a lot of uh, room for, um, for a school 
um, or a conference that is to, you know, to sort of intervene. So we're, you know, frankly, trying to serve as a resource to our schools. Um, we are, you know, gathering our lawyers to try to have them have a platform where they can exchange notes. We're looking to the NCA more or less for some guidance here. Um, so uh, it's a work in progress. I did want to say with uh, respect to the last question, I think this is a, this will be another but it'll be a real positive, but it could be another burden that student athletes may be bearing on the mental health front. Um, you know, this was noted in our inquiry um, that sort of the locker room challenges of student athletes having disparate outcomes with their NIL arrangements is, is certainly possible. Yeah, yeah. You know, if, if one, you know, one kid is getting all the deals or getting the big deals and others who came in expecting to get deals, aren't getting anything or getting really low level deals, it's hard not to imagine. I mean, athletes are competitive, aren't they? So it's hard not to imagine them sort of competing with each other and then getting disappointed if they're at the low, you know, the low rungs of the ladder in terms of the NIL hierarchy. So, I, you know, to Blake's point, I think at the end of the day, it's a, you know, it's a huge positive, but it may well be that schools have to add to the services that they're providing to these athletes in order to help them deal with the fallout, if you will, if there is some of, uh, you know, of these, uh, again, disparate outcomes when it comes to NIL. Katie, can I add something real quick? I, what Val said about anticipation and disappointment, that's huge with regard to mental health. And, you know, I, I saw uh, an article that was in Sportico uh, that via uh, one of the writers for Sports Illustrated and even Open Doors said the average NIL income for the month of July was $471, uh, where a top athlete did earn six figures. And 88% of those transactions came from social media, 79% of those from athletes who are football players. So one, I, I think what can eliminate the anxiety of anticipation and disappointment would be education. But you know, can we also think of areas where, you know, the athletes, maybe are they being sold a bill of goods right now? Uh, the fact that you can make all of these projections, uh, but when you take a look at the deals that have happened, no real deals of huge magnitude have occurred right now. And maybe we're building up their hopes uh, only to have a letdown sometime later on. I, I think that's something that certainly needs to be looked at. I think just to speak on that, that this is a situation where perspective matters, right? And if I was in college and I had $471 in my pocket in the month of July, I'd feel like the richest man in Nebraska. Right? Oh, I know, I know. <laughs> but when people are telling you that, you know, you're going to get a $1,000 a week or you're going to make X amount of dollars, you have that uh, anticipation yeah. anxiety. And when it doesn't happen, then what? No, certainly. I think that those people will be for, like further away from this industry as it matures, right? The realities are that no one solves the supply and demand issue. Le legitimate bona fide NIL activities come down to your marketability, right? And like, that's the education piece. Right. Uh, working, that's what you need to tell them. Well, yeah. The discussion about Nils and mental health is important, but the much mm -hmm. more important discussion is the atmosphere that prevails in athletic departments. Uh, when you have an atmosphere that is calling upon students to spend 40 or 50 hours a week on their sport and still be a student, we have an atmosphere that says you can't major in this because it's, it conflicts with, with our practice times. If you have an atmosphere where the coach feels it's fine to take the kids out in summer football practice in 90 degree weather and have them do wind sprints and, until they fall over, that's not an atmosphere that promotes mental health. So it seems to me that it's a much broader question about transforming our approach to college sports if we if we want to deal with mental health issues. Awesome. Thank you all so much for your insights today. I think that's going to be our last question because we're approaching two o'clock and we do want to be respectful of everybody's time. But thank you all so much for giving us some of your time today and sharing your expertise. Thank you so much for um, the attendees today for registering and showing up and asking really thought provoking questions. Um, we encourage you all to click on the Drake group link that is located in the chat. Um, to learn more about our organization and how you can support our efforts in college sports reform. And we also encourage uh, you to sign up for next Thursday's NIL conversation with current and former college athletes on the same topic. Um, so you can register in that link that's in the chat and you will also be receiving an invitation in your inbox as well if you uh, registered for this event. So once again, thank you so much everybody for coming today. We really appreciate your time and we hope to see you next week.